Thank you for joining our webinar. My name is Colin, and I'll be moderating today's session. Before we begin, please note that due to the number of participants attending the event today, phone and voiceover IP lines will be muted during the session to minimize background noise and to ensure that everyone can clearly hear the presenters. We will be accepting written questions today, and those will be read during a designated Q&A session. To send a question, please use the Notes tab in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen and address your notes to all moderators. Or you can click on the Participants tab at the top of your screen and then select Send Note to All Presenters. There will also be an opportunity to ask your questions verbally today, at which point I'll give you instructions on how you can ask a question over the phone lines. Lastly, if at any time you experience technical difficulties, please feel free to send a note to me. That would be the ATT CES operator. And with that, I would now like to formally begin today's conference and introduce Liz Clark. Good morning, everybody. I'm Liz Clark, and I'm a training specialist on the Professional Development Services Branch staff. Thanks for joining us today for the Florida New World Screwworm Incident Webinar. Our speakers today are Dr. Joanna Davis and Dr. Sean Bolton. Dr. Joanna Davis received her DBM from the University of Georgia's College of Veterinary Medicine in 1996 and worked as a mixed animal practitioner in South Georgia for 11 years. In 2001, she was a veterinary responder for the UK foot and mouth disease outbreak. From 2007 to 2015, she served as a field veterinary medical officer with USDA APHIS Veterinary Services in South Georgia. Dr. Davis received a graduate certificate in veterinary homeland security from Purdue University in 2012. In March 2015, she became the emergency coordinator for Georgia and Florida. In 2015, she served as the deputy operations chief on the avian influenza outbreak in May 2015 and is the liaison officer for the 2016 New World Screwworm outbreak in the Florida Keys. Dr. Davis is based out of the USDA APHIS office in Conyers, Georgia. Dr. Bolton received his veterinary degree from Auburn University College of Veterinary Medicine in 1990 and then returned to his home state of Tennessee and entered private practice. He is a 1995 graduate of the Swine Executive Program in Health Management from Iowa State and the University of Illinois. Dr. Bolton began his career with APHIS Vet Services in 2000, July of 2004 as a field VMO officer in western Tennessee. Dr. Bolton's primary work interests are emergency response and disease event incident management. He has deployed to numerous disease incidents, just recently three deployments to the New World Screwworm Incident in Florida as Operations Section Chief. He currently serves as the Operations Section Chief for the VS Red National Incident Management Team. Dr. Bolton has served as the Area Emergency Coordinator for Tennessee since July of 2016. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Davis. All right, thanks Liz and thanks everyone for joining on the webinar today. Hopefully this will um, shed some light on this and uh, we can try and knock this back if it ever rears its head again uh, anywhere. So you see our little friend there that's our screw on the chair on the background screen. So we'll just run on to the next slide here. Um, so what screw am I? So, so my is when you've got that tissue destruction from a fly or maggot or some type of parasite. And you see there the scientific name for it. And for a new world screwworm, the Cochlearmia omnivorax, omnivorax actually means man eating or flesh eating. And so that's kind of, you know, back when they started to figure this out, they pretty much nailed it on the head with this one. And the reason that this is so destructive is because this particular parasite, or, and this maggot especially, they are, tend to be found in the warmer regions of the Western Hemisphere versus the Old World. Screwworm, which is typically found over in parts of Central Asia, down into um, in some cases in Africa. So in other parts of the world, it's typically Old World screwworm. Here in the Western Hemisphere, we do have the New World screwworm. It most often affects warm-blooded animals, um, and there are some a few cases in birds, including chickens, and there are some anecdotal reports in reptiles as well. And these flies can lay their eggs and are attracted to wounds as small as a tick bite. They can also lay their eggs in things such as navel passages. Um, navels of newborns in some cases can reach 100% when you've got a lot of animals dropping and you've got just a huge fly infestation in an area. 100% of newborns could potentially be infected through uh, their navel. And then also an external genitalia wounds, um, which is you know, part of the reason that this got kind of out of hand with um, the key deer down there is that they coincided with the rut when they would have injuries anyway. So we'll jump into that here. Second. 
so what distinguishes um, this screw worm is that this actually feeds on living flesh. And for those of you that are on the call that are veterinarians, we've got our regular everyday maggots that are out there, but those tend to feed on decaying flesh. Whereas this one will feed on um, living flesh and just continue to cause more and more tissue destruction. And a reintroduction into the United States could cost more than $1 billion to the livestock industry. And as well, it can pose you know, significant health risks to both pets and to humans. Next slide. <clears throat> and I understand there's probably going to be a little bit of a lag, so I'm just going to jump in and keep going as the slides start to load on this as well. So the life cycle of this particular New World screwworm fly, they ordinarily live about 21 days, depending on the temperature or moisture in the soil type that they have. And we'll start this slide in the upper left-hand corner. So within 48 hours of egg seeing or hatching from their pupa, they're already sexually mature. And what's really important to understand about this fly and why this sterile insect technique has been very successful in eradicating screwworms in parts of the world is that a couple of things. The males, as soon as they hatch, within 48 hours, they're already out looking for girlfriends. They're aggressively singing out some females to mate with. And so because the supplies that we're using that have been sterilized, when those females will lay the eggs, those eggs never um, reach maturity. And so ultimately we wipe out that population. So the males are aggressive in nature and seeking out females, and then the, the females will only mate once in their lifetime. Those are very important factors in the success of having the sterile insect technique that's done a great job at eradicating it. And so adults, um, they can fly for about 10 to 14 days, and they're capable of traveling large distances. This is what was a little bit nerve-wracking when we first got confirmation back in early October because that was also the same week that Hurricane Matthew was moving up the Atlantic. And so we were concerned were they going to um, catch the wind and ride it with the hurricane as well, but uh, the hurricane actually did miss the Keys. They just got, you know, just a kind of a breezy day and the hurricane actually hit a little bit further north from there. But we also had a natural barrier that I'll show you in one of the upcoming slides. There was a seven mile bridge between where the infested area primarily was located and then where our um, incident command post was. So in some respects, that the flies really only travel just a few miles. We say large distances, it's usually just a few miles that that helped us somewhat in that they um, were not, you know, traveling all the way onto the mainland um, that we're aware of. And so then going around the corner on the right-hand side, the females begin to uh, lay their eggs about six days after egg feasting, and they can lay an average of four batches to two to 500 eggs on the end of a wound. So you could have just one fly, she could lay 2,000 eggs on a wound. And as these maggots, if you go down in the eggs hatch and within a day, they can enter and feed that wound, and then they start to feed on that living flesh for you know, five to seven days. So what happens as these maggots start to feed, they destroy more and more tissue, obviously. That scent and the blood and the serous sanguis fluid, that attracts more flies to that wound. And so more and more female flies are going to come and lay more eggs, just perpetuating the cycle of, the, the cycle of laying eggs and tissue destruction. Um, moving along further, so after the larva has completed their feeding cycle, about five to seven days, they then fall off of the wound and burr into the ground. And just like many parasites, they don't like cooler temperatures, so they're usually not going to survive soil temperatures or outdoor temperatures that are below 46 degrees for any period of time. And then within a week to two months, they can pupate in the soil. And that, again, depends on the temperature, the soil conditions, and the humidity in the area. And then we start back over again. They hatch back out and keep on going. And the next slide. So the history of New World screwworms here in the Western Hemisphere release that we're aware of is that the first reports of this were in the mid-1850s and 1852. These only had the first reports of what's con now considered New World screwworms. And in the 1930s, the southeastern United States just cost producers millions of dollars annually in losses because they were just, again, I mean, this was almost 100 years ago, so they didn't have sterile insect technique. They didn't really have uh, anything to keep the flies off of animals. And so we lost millions of dollars. So ultimately, in the mid-1950s, um, scientists began working on a development to make sterile male flies. And this was at a facility actually in Seabring, Florida, in Central Florida. So what they had determined in this is that they had learned if they could irradiate these nail flies, they, they grow the flies out, they irradiate them at the time they were x-rays, now they're cobalt rays, and then they can affect their gonads such that they are infertile. 
And so it doesn't affect the fly any other way. Um, these obviously are not genetically modified flies. But so then as these flies start to hatch out and they're taking out their females, when they mate, they are not going to have um, the fertile offspring. And so as they started to put this sterile insect technique into play, they released a lot of pupa from airplanes at the time during um, the 50s and early 60s, releasing them throughout Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, a lot of the southeastern states that were really affected by screwworms. And over time, by 1966, the U.S. was declared free of screwworms. And so we would still have a few incursions of animals, especially in Texas and the southwestern United States, where animals would come across from, from Mexico. And so the U.S. and Mexico in 1972 struck an agreement so that we could work on eradicating screwworms from Mexico as well using the same technique. And so it took up until 1991, and in 1991, Mexico was declared free of screwworms. And then from there, it moved on through Central America to really reinforce that barrier to reintroduction from flies that may come in. And in 2006, that's when Panama was declared free from storms. And so there's something down there called the Darien Gap. And so that really is, that's where that, that team down there is standing in the gap with COPEG and International Services. And they opened a sterile fly rearing facility. And that's where they breed the flies, they feed them as maggots, and then they put them in the radiation chambers. And then they, as they come out as pupa, then that's where we get our pupa that we're using down there in the Keys. And we also do have skewer present in a few Caribbean islands in South America, uh, and so that's why we have strict control measures. For anybody that's interested, we could do a whole webinar just on the sterile insect technique, but on the APHIS webpage that deals with screwworms, there's a really good, there's a storyboard that LPA put together that's outstanding. And then there are also some links on there to the Agriculture Research Service and International Services that goes into much more detail about the sterile insect technique. So it's very interesting if y'all are interested in reading that. So you see here too, the next slide is we have a map of when we had uh, eradication. So there in the 50s, in the late 50s, we were treating in the southeastern United States and really kind of pushed everything back. And then from Louisiana west, it took until 1966 to eradicate screwworms in the United States. And you can see there the progression that we keep pushing it further and further back down into Central America. And um, of course, we do still have it in Cuba, some of those other Caribbean islands as well. So you see the history of eradication there here in this part of the hemisphere. Uh, and the next slide. So in 2016, we were just kind of going along, and as usual, late on a Friday afternoon, that's when we actually did get confirmation from NVSL that a sample that was submitted to them from a key deer down in the Florida Keys was confirmed positive for New World screwworm. So the retrospective investigation done by SIA and other EPIs showed that the index case was likely around July the 5th last summer. And Originally, fly strike was a presumptive diagnosis, and these were all in the key deer. And we'll kind of get into what key deer are. For those of you that are not familiar, if you know your typical white-tailed deer, they're just a much smaller version. Over years of evolution, they've just become a much smaller breed. And there's a lot of human and animal interface in that. So the, the public down there, they were seeing uh, these deer that were affected by screwworms too. It's run by Department of Interior, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And so they were noticing the deer as well, and they were kind of treating them and consulting um, down in the area to what could be going on with the deer. So finally, by September 30th, that's when we were, um, did get the confirmation of positive, and that was, again, on a Friday afternoon as usual. So infested key deer, they were noticed in what's called Big Pine Key, and we'll show them up in just a moment. But that's kind of a part of the central key in that area, and that's where the actual key deer refuge is located. And there were, I think the census numbers were about, they estimated to be about 1,000 deer over the entire refuge system. And like I said, this is still a very residential area, so people are accustomed to seeing deer in that area too. And originally, New World Scrum was just not suspected. The other unfortunate thing that happened at the same time was that the injuries in the deer coincided with the rut of the bucks. And so as the bucks were fighting and injuring each other with their antlers, then those wounds would just attract more and more screwworms. And it's not unusual, unfortunately, to have hit by car injuries down there, too, just because it is such a residential area. And there were possibly four cases seen in pets by local veterinarians into um, August and September. Thankfully, there have been no reported cases in humans. 
and the incident management team did engage county public health um, from the beginning of their response in the Keys. Monroe County, we just can't say enough good things about them and how involved and active they were in this response from the very beginning. But in discussing with hospitals, uh, county public health, all of those different entities, there were no known reported cases. And we we're a little bit concerned because down there we do have so many people um, that might, uh, that come in as immigrants and don't English or know where to get help, so they really put the word out and helped a lot with that too. And there are also no livestock cases. The I guess the upside to this is too is that the keys are very long and narrow, so there's really not a lot of room to really have any livestock down there. Uh, there are a handful of horses in a few different areas. Some people had pot-bellied pig just as an unusual pet, but there's not a really big livestock population down there. And this is the first established case of screwworms in the last 50 years. And it's uh, sporadically entered uh, into the United States on imported pets and animals when they were traveling abroad. I know we've had some cases down at the Miami Import Center of horses that had come up maybe from South America, dogs that had come back home from all over the world. We've had both old and new world screw room, um, in infections in singular animals over the years, but nothing that's ever been an established population since then. So the animal transmission, so just kind of going back to our fly life cycle, we see that the female is going to lay her eggs around wounds, and again, they can be very small. And you can see here that, obviously we've got this circled in here, these little egg packets, they're, they're very, very bright white, and they're skinny and long. They almost look like miniature pieces of rice, and they're obviously very sticky so that those egg packets stick together. You can also see that she's laying another packet of eggs right there as well, just in another margin. She jumped her three to 500 eggs there on the margin, and she's moving on to the next one. And unfortunately, multiple infestations in one wound are very common. Like I said, as those maggots start to feed and uh, they cause tissue destruction, they're going to attract more and more flies out there to lay more eggs. And it can just perpetuate that cycle. And this is not contagious animal to animal, as you would imagine. <coughs> The next slide in your morbidity and mortality. So typically the morbidity can vary with the age of the animal, the organ affected. When it gets into those newborn animals and their umbilicus, of course, they have very little fat. They don't have any immune, immunity that you speak up. And so they're very susceptible to screwworms. And as we'll see in these pictures that are coming up too, because these bucks were fighting and they had uh, injuries around their head and neck and their antlers, then a lot of the screwworm tissue damage this time around was to the head and to the face, and it, they got into um, the cranium as well and into the brain cavity. And animals can also become systemically ill just from the secondary bacterial infections. Like anything else we see, you break that skin barrier, and then you have no more protection for the bacteria that are part of the normal flora of the skin. The upside is that treatment with parasiticides can be successful when it's detected early before you get too much tissue destruction in there. We've, you know, the other animals that we've seen from other countries that have come in, they might have a singular infection and as soon as it's caught they're treated and then the animals go on to do just fine. We did have a handful of animals down there in the Keys that we, um, they were confirmed and the animals were treated and they uh, were healed successfully and we've even seen some cases in some of those key deer after the treatment was instituted there that it appears to be that some of those wounds had healed as well. And so the mortality, if it's less than treated, depending on the age of the animal, it could be fatal within 7 to 14 days. <clears throat> All right, and so going on for the clinical signs here. Uh, so as we've stressed before, you can start to see larvae by day three. They tend to, the eggs hatch out and within you know, 12 hours they're starting to feed on flesh. You just may not see them for the first few days. You can have hundreds, even thousands present in this one, honestly. And some of them get to be very, very large. 17 millimeters, that's a really long maggot right there. So it's almost unmistakable. And you can see in this picture, this is a picture I believe it was from the late 1990s that COPEG had taken, and that's the facility with international services down in Panama. And this dog actually was in Jamaica that one of the COPEG, I, I believe it was Dr. Welch, they had a picture of this dog. And you can see the little black dots, those are the trabecula that are sticking up from the maggot. That's their little air hole. And then you can see other large maggots laying longitudinally across there. They're just huge maggots causing a lot of destruction. You get that discharge from the tissue destruction. In many cases, you can have just a really foul, just decaying odor. 
And um, you can just see a few small wounds in some cases, but then once you clean that wound and open it up, you can just have packets and packets of maggots all down in there. And um, as you would imagine as well, the animals can be really depressed. They go off feed. They isolate themselves. Okay, for anyone who may be on the call that might be a little bit squeamish, some of these might be um, a little bit graphic for you, but it's pertinent to the nature of the disease to show you the destruction that's in here. So we'll start off a little bit slow. So uh, this is one of the bucks that had been, um, I, I don't remember specifically on this one if he had been hit by a car and died or if this is just another one that was tracked and euthanized. You can obviously see here, these are the female screwworm flies that are swarming the wound. And they, you can tell that they're kind of a bright, shiny, bluish green color. I will tell you, we have these hotlines that were set up. And so as we put out the information, then a lot of people will call in, well, we know we have screwworm flies out here. They look very similar to our regular bot fly that you would see um, any time. But because of the heightened vigilance, uh, people were noticing these types of things out there as well. And these are pretty aggressive flies. They'll kind of dive bomb rather than just fly around. And these pictures might take a minute to load up. But so the following slides, you'll just see a really severe maggot infestation. You'll also see other flies swarming the wound. And you'll also have females that are laying eggs in this one, too. That's kind of that grayish white that you see on the margins of the wound. And then the maggots are deep down in the wound. The following slide is uh, obviously a buck that had been uh, sustained a lot of tissue damage and was either found dead or then tracked and euthanized. But you can see here that the maggots have fed into the skull and into the brain tissue. I mean, they have gone through the skull. That's just how aggressive they can be. Uh, the following slide, um, was, again, we've got flies laying eggs. So you can see on there, that's a really good picture of the longitudinal orientation of those egg packets and just how tiny and straight they can be. So if anyone is out there and they see this, we want to get this message out. This is not just for APHIS or for VS. This is for State Departments of Agriculture, Extension, livestock producers, veterinarians. There are some things that are very distinctive uh, about this parasite and how they respond. So we want to get the word out on this. So this is very uh, typical to see that you've got maggots, you've got flies, and you've got eggs all in one wound. The next slide is one of the pictures um, from a dog that was seen late last summer. And you can see, I don't remember what the injury was originally on this dog. It uh, looks kind of like a bite wound. But you can see in there you've got some small wounds, but then you've just got these just packets of maggots all up underneath um, that wound on there as well. And once they were able to clean this dog up, and um, the, our next slide actually is kind of the pan where they collected some of the maggots. You see how large they are on there? And can somebody tell, are my slides pretty well keeping up with you guys? Uh, we're still on the dog slide at the moment. OK. And it just switched right, down to uh, okay. extract it from previous dog. OK. All right. Yeah, I just want to make sure I wasn't getting too, too far ahead, even with the lag, OK? Yeah, so these are some of the maggots that were collected from the previous dog. And then the next slide that you'll see that comes up was a stray cat that was trapped, I believe. Um, this one might have come from Big Pine Key. We had, um, there's a lot of stray cats that live down in the Keys and a lot of rescue groups that will feed cats. So we did get a lot of call about stray cats, and this just happened to be one that was trapped. And it's in pretty bad shape. You can, I don't know if you can really tell from the picture, it's probably pretty thin. And um, just the, the one picture that we got had all of those maggots in the ear. I didn't follow up with this case to find out if they necropsied or to see if there was um, tissue destruction further down into the ear canal or the brain. But this kitty was euthanized and was confirmed positive for screwworms. And I will say, too, um, this will, again, come up as we get into the response part of this as well. We got, um, because of the vigilance, um, especially the Florida Department of Agriculture, we had a lot of calls from people even on the mainland and all over the Keys that they suspected cases of it. And so every case that came in, FDAX or Florida Department of Ag, they would follow up on all of those. And um, we would constantly be sending in samples. Thankfully, many of them came back negative. Um, but thanks to the vigilance there, we were able to um, track and do really good surveillance on this too. So you see here, um, <clears throat> this buck that's laying here, by the time he was found, you can see, I mean, his 
face is gone. I mean, his eyes have, have gone, I mean, down, you know, halfway toward his nares they're just completely gone back to the back side of his antlers on there as well. And um, so this, like I said, it had been going on for a few months. And so you know that this animal just suffered and died terribly. Okay, and then this final slide um, of the grody pictures. Uh, this is another bug. This one was found kind of late in the outbreak, but I think this is one that they, that the public had seen and been calling about him. They were just, it took a while for them to be able to track him. And you see, he's just got a massive shoulder one. There's actually an interesting video that um, one of our HTs was able to take of them collecting it, but it's just, even though these deer are small, that's, that's just a massive wound on there, just causing tremendous pain to this animal. All right, next slide. So just a little bit on the key deer refuge down there in the Keys. Like I said, this is administered by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and our Department of Interior. So we had, um, obviously, USDA, Department of Interior, and state and county um, that were all working together on this response, too. So key deer are endangered. Um, they're, you know, their environment's been encroached upon over years. And like I said, for the estimates, they suspect there were about 1,000 key deer on the islands as of last summer, and they are spread out on about 20 or so keys. Some of these keys are very remote that you have to get a boat to get out there. The deer may swim a little bit or they may walk out at low tide, but they estimate them to be on about 20 different keys or islands. And then they do reside on the refuge, and they freely wander into, into the urban and residential areas out there. So you can see there, I mean, this is, many of the deer would just come up to you. A lot of them, even though people are not supposed to feed deer, they do anyway. People would name the deer. Um, we had Fluffy, we had Marshmallow, we had Bob. We had, you know, people just had names for these deer. And they were, in many cases, very tame. So people would notice when they would have these wounds on them. So even though it was a bad idea from a wildlife management point of view, in some ways it kind of helped because people knew these deer and they would call in when they would see animals with wounds on them so they could be tracked and used in us to try and cut back on that infestation. And the community was incredibly engaged, and they really wanted to assist in the response because they had seen it going on for a couple of months, and it continued to get worse as the rut went on there, too. So um, this was a lot different from some of our other responses in, as far as how much the public was really engaged and involved in this. Um, one of the, I think the second Saturday we were down there, we had a community meeting there in Big Pine, and I think there were over with, you know, with us, with FDAX, with Fish and Wildlife. Um, there were over 120 people from the community that were there wanting to know what was being done about it, too. Uh, we can say, though, that uh, Fish and Wildlife did say that in 2016 the fall crop was very good and survival was good, so it seems like they would have become infested sometime between late May and maybe mid-June, end of June, because if we saw those first cases, like we said, about July the 5th, they got infected somewhere there probably in June. In addition to the deer, this is what was a little bit tricky in trying to decide how to manage this disease in the deer. Not only the deer that are the endangered species on there, there are other species, a lot of insect species, that inhabit the key deer refuge as well. Um, so the refuge itself, here's a couple of close-ups of the Florida Keys. It was a little bit warmer working in the Keys than when we were doing the AI response up in the Upper Midwest last year. So um, you guys see there, if anyone's not really familiar with the Keys, this is down on the southwest corner. Uh, Florida, and uh, Marathon and Big Pine, that's kind of the center part of the Keys, you see Key West there, and right where that yellow star is, that's where the Key Deer Refuge is located. And then in the larger picture there too, you can see Miami is down there in the proximity to Havana, Cuba, to some of the other Caribbean islands as well, to give you just a geographic overview. And with the key deer on this one as well, so you can see a little bit of uh, an epi curve. I didn't want this to be, um, um, overdo the epi on this. I would love to fill it up with charts and graphs and everything, but um, just to give everyone an overview, you see the number of cases that were suspected um, all throughout from July through November. And once we finally got confirmation at the end of September, that's our red star there, you see that the number of cases really spiked those first couple of weeks of September. That's when the public, um, was really involved and engaged, that's when we began our response too. And so the number just really spiked up there because everyone, we knew then what we had, people were seeing it, they were calling it in, so that's why we had so many um, numbers of confirmed animals out there as well. And that also coincided with when we began the sterile insect release on October the 11th. 
And then by the end of October, that's when Fish and Wildlife um, began doing their treatment program too, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. So you see here, we kind of went on the downhill slide getting into November. Uh, we had a case, uh, uh, Sean or somebody can correct me, we had a case in mid-November, another one in December, and then our last one was January 7th. So we feel relatively confident that we're on the downhill slide of this. And as the weather starts to warm back up again, just continuing the vigilance on here as well. And thank you to Diane Kitchen for this slide too, if she's on there. Following slide. So the myosis that we saw um, in animals besides key deer, there was one that was suspected in July of 2016 uh, in a dog. There was a pot-bellied pig also in July in the same area, Big Pine Key. There's a lot of campgrounds in this area, and while it is residential, it's not overgrown. There's still a lot of it that's uh, covered up in this uh, National Wildlife Refuge. So they've got a, a lot of mangroves, they've got some toxic plants in there, so there's still a lot of wild area left in there as well. Lots of campgrounds, walking trails. Um, so there's a lot of areas that these deer go. Um, it's a great opportunity for flies to breed. It's a wonderful environment for them as well. Uh, there was another dog that was seen in Big Pine Key in August, and then another dog in a neighboring key called Ramrod Key in August as well. And up to that point, um, the examining veterinarian had not reported to the state animal health official. And so our response efforts, this really has been a multi-agency response. And, um, you know, we're getting into, you know, six months into this now just about. So we had um, state officials, we had Florida Department of Ag and Consumer Services, we had Florida um, Fish and Game Commission, or I'm sorry, FWCC, Florida Conservation Commission on there as well. Monroe County uh, is down there, and they met um, Dr. Creasy with FDAX and Dr. Young with USDA. They met them down there at the airport. They helped us set up the ICP down there. We just can't say enough good things about Monroe County and how cooperative they've been in this entire response and welcoming us in um, to help eradicate this disease. And it's interesting, too, because they were just kind of on the, this is an aside, but just on the heels of the Zika response down there. They just said it was, you know, they, they, gave, they gave a compliment to the departments of agriculture, state and federal, on how this was handled versus how um, things went in the Zika response as well, is that they appreciated our, our vigilance and the presence and everyone down there and just kind of jumping on top of this and not um, letting it, or trying to get ahead of it again there, too. So it, we don't often hear a lot of compliments on what we do, but Monroe County was very grateful for the response here, too. So you can see the um, National ACES Incident Management Team was on site, FDAX, and again, that's the acronym for Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. We um, found out on Friday by Sunday afternoon, Saturday evening, Sunday afternoon, folks started arriving down there after our initial confirmation. And some of the activities that we did, outreach was just a huge part of this and continues to be down there. And so it was to the general public. Uh, we had a radio station that did, and I believe they still do, weekly um, radio bits on there called US1 Radio, Miami Herald, BBC, and New York Times. I mean, this has gotten worldwide attention as well. Um, I say producers on there. This goes up into the mainland of Florida with livestock producers. There just was not a lot right there on the Keys, but we did talk to um, smaller groups on there, did a lot of community meetings all throughout the Keys. Um, immediately, uh, we kind of tapped into the toll-free number that FWCC had down there as well so that the public could call in the domestic cases. And so FWCC and U.S. Fish and Wildlife work cooperatively um, whenever the public would call in to try and track down deer in an area. They would give us a geographic location, kind of a description of what they were seeing. They saw a buck with a wound on his right shoulder. So they would try and turn that around really quickly to get out to um, track those animals down to try and meet them us, and if they could at the time, and then ultimately um, treat them if that was feasible. Uh, there were one or two community clinics that were set up because, of course, the public was very worried that their pets were endangered as well. So in Big Pine Key, everyone shops at the Winn-Dixie that's there. It's the only grocery store there on the island. So one Saturday, um, they worked with the local Humane Society with FDAX employees, and there was a, um, a clinic that was set up where people could bring their pets just to be inspected for screw -on. So it was really good in that it built a, a lot of goodwill within the community for us having to come in there and do this. So they appreciated that being provided too. And there's an interdiction station that was set up at Key Largo and is still there. That's the one road in and one road out on the Keys. Many places where boats can come and go, but that's the only road in and out. 
And in fact, when I did this um, presentation at the end of last week, it's probably over 14,000 animals inspected to date. For any animals other than livestock, it is voluntary for people to stop. Their livestock must stop, and they do have uh, Florida law enforcement that's there with them, um, but they have inspected that many animals. No cases of scrum have been detected there. Um, we did engage early on with the Florida Veterinary Medical Association to get the word out to practicing veterinarians. Um, FDACs especially made a lot of personal visits to veterinary clinics, both in the Keys and up in the South Florida, and continue to do that. Airports, ferry services, marinas, state national parks in the areas, just really trying to blanket it and get the message out about it so that we didn't miss a single case that was out there, and really trying to engage the public in our passive surveillance activities as well. So on fly surveillance, we've got a, fly, or a slide coming up about fly surveillance here in just a minute, but that's to detect the um, extent of infestation in those areas. We also did disease surveillance, trying to find those, those additional cases, like what I just mentioned with the surveillance in the public. And then we, of course, wanted to prevent infestation up into the mainland of Florida. Not enough that it was in the Keys, but thankfully there's not a big livestock population down there, but we really wanted to try and keep it South Florida has got a lot of cattle down there. Um, they've got huge cow-calf operations. There are dairies in other parts of the state, lots of horses down there. So we really were trying to um, do everything we could to be very aggressive and keep it off the mainland of Florida. And as I said, um, we did institute the sterile insect technique. October 11th was the first date um, that flies were released. And um, 35 sites had been set up with the cooperation of International Services and Steve Scott of Pam Phillips, John Welch, they all worked together to determine the best sites that we could release. And when I say we release flies, we set up PETA is actually what it is. And to date, there have been over 117 million flies released in both the Keys and in Homestead. And um, like I said, if anyone sees the sit reps, we really see the precipitous drop in some of those cases and hope that that continues as well. The next slide. So in our agencies within the incident management team, you can see there's uh, Veterinary Services for Department of Ag, Monroe County Emergency Operations Center, and Florida Fish and Wild, or, I'm sorry, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services. And they, in fact, at their um, station over there on Big Pine Key, they set up kind of a separate um, operational. They were they would send someone over, usually their liaison officer, over to our ICP on Marathon. We were set up at the Marathon Airport, and then. Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife had their office over there on Big Pine Key, so we would communicate back and forth to them, and at least once or twice a week, um, we would go down to their meetings, they would come up to our meetings, so it was a good cooperation between those two agencies there. And wildlife services, they were wonderful in coming in. Um, they assisted Fish and Wildlife Service in using the, and tracking and euthanizing deer um, that appeared to be infected. And then again, can't say enough about Agriculture Research Service, International Services, and COPEG, and just the leadership they've taken in this. This is what they do all day, every day, down there in the Darien Gap in Panama, and they just jump um, right on this, and really, really just great cooperators in trying to get the sterile insects up here and continue to do so. They've ramped up production tremendously over what they would normally do, for their every because they do this every day down there in Central America anyway. And then we've asked them to ramp up tremendously in the last several months, and they've met the challenge. Uh, again, on the uh, refuge operations out there, as I mentioned, um, Fish and Wildlife and FWCC, they would respond to calls from the public hotline. And then um, a few weeks in, the Wildlife Services, they would send a few people down there to help in tracking and euthanizing the deer. The disposal of the deer up until uh, the 1st of October, because it's under Department of Interior, and how they manage their wildlife and carcasses and things that go on out there, they would return those deer to the landscape. Um, but once we did confirm that it was New World Screwworm, just so that we didn't want to perpetuate breeding uh, more flies out there, after that, those carcasses were collected and frozen. They did rent a huge freezer, and then excuse me, um, there was an incinerator that made its way down, I believe, from Mississippi. And um, within that incinerator, we could do three to five carcasses per each run, and it for the most part, I think we're in 24 hours. We had one weekend maybe where we had to stop for maintenance, but for the most part, we got a little bit of a backlog, kept them in the freezer, but eventually as those cases started to drop off, uh, everything was going fine, and they continue, um, or had continued, and when we had them continually incinerated in those two. And then um, eventually, so there's a lot of cooperation between Fish and Wildlife and USDA in trying to figure out how do we balance 
trying to minimize the fly population down there. Um, but still, um, Interior has their mission that they are supposed to protect these endangered species. And so, um, originally, it, they don't ordinarily treat wildlife with our typical antiparasitics that we would use in livestock and other species because some of the byproducts could adversely affect the ecosystem and the flora and fauna down there. But ultimately, uh, with a lot of um, talking and working out the details, they did begin uh, treating deer with Doramexin, or Dectamax, as many of you know it. Um, they gave it both orally, and originally we did it with white bread down there. They would have a team of volunteers, and this is where the community got involved. And they would just cover the bread and Doramexin. They would go out hand feed the deer. Um, and then ultimately they figured out they could um, treat produce. And then when I was last down there, we did donut holes too. So even deer like donut holes. Not that we're advocating for that, but whatever it takes to get those deer um, to do it. And um, then also they did have um, the rollers that you would see, especially like out in Texas and some other places, having those the rollers that were treated in Dormectin as well at treatment stations. Uh, in some cases they could immobilize and treat clinical cases. In fact, they had built up uh, kind of a corral or a pinning area where if they needed to, if they had cases that needed uh, more treatment, they could keep those animals confined and do it that way. The public was kind of upset at the beginning because they didn't necessarily understand. They see that these deer are tame, they're coming up in their backyard, they're eating from their hands. Well, why can't you just, you know, trap that animal and keep it somewhere and treat it for that duration? Not understanding that it's one thing to feed it one time and you can maybe scratch it on the head, but trying to contain what is still a wild animal than um, anything because these animals just get so stressed out so quickly and they could um, die of myosis uh, pretty rapidly on that one. So trying to, they built um, some treatment areas so that they could still have room to roam around and not be quite so stressed out, but then immobilize them as needed to. That was the case. And that all of that's still ongoing. So on that, did they get to the point where they were treating um, any deer on that one? Sean? I'm sorry, what was your question, Joanna? Were they treating any of the deer in those treatment stations, immobilizing and treating? Did they get to that point? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay. But they did have all that set up in case they ever got to that point. But about the time it was set up was when the cases started to drop off a bit. Yes. Yeah, so here are some pictures here. Um, I think this is actually the Commissioner of Agriculture for Florida, if that's the correct picture I'm looking at, and this is just how easy it is to treat some of those deer, and then the treatment station here on your right. And again, um, a lot of the animals had injuries around their head and neck, and so when they were going in to get some of the corn, that's when they were getting treated with Dormectin as well. And then again, some of the outreach material that was done for the Department of Agriculture created this poster, and they did it in English and in Spanish, and uh, I believe they were doing it in Creole as well, because we do have some Haitians that are down there. And uh, it just gives information on what screwworm is, and we plastered this all over. There's also a trifle brochure that they did uh, with all this information. And you see there at the bottom right hand of your screen, that's the um, 800 number where people could and still do call in if they suspect any cases of screwworm anywhere around the state. Uh, so in doing the fly assessment, so the way these are performed is that you bait flies with liver and then you ultimately capture adult flies. That's the end goal of this. And uh, with Dr. Welch with International Services, he's been there from the very beginning. He is our worldwide SME on New World Screwworms. And um, so when they trap these flies, they will evaluate for a wild type of screwworm to see if they have sterile wild flies versus fertile wild flies. Um, so then they'll kind of do those proportions and um, you can see here the number of keys uh, where they had been doing fly assessments on there. Six uh, down there in the southern surveillance zone closer to Key West, 27 in the infested zone. And right now they're in the process of, of developing a training program to prepare other USDA and state employees to bait and ID flies because this assessment may go on for many more months even after we're not doing these active daily operations. John, did you have anything else on that one you wanted to add for the fly assessment since you were down there a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, just just a little on uh, determining a uh, sterile fly from a fertile fly uh, in all these zones, uh, infested zone, surveillance zones. Uh, surveillance is, is ongoing daily uh, as well as uh, in the homestead area on the mainland. And so... Individuals that are doing this surveillance 
have to be trained to recognize various species of flies, but certainly to be able to uh, determine uh, which ones are, are actually screw worm. Um, there's another species, a cochleomyia, that's uh, common in the area, uh, cochleomyia mascularia, and, and to, to the untrained eye, these, these flies are basically identical. Um, so the especially is being able to develop uh, uh, an awareness of, of the differences in those two and being able to capture uh, the screw worm. Then additionally, uh, each of those samples that are submitted for surveillance have to be dissected and uh, slides prepared uh, of the uh, reproductive organs and looked at under a microscope on high power. And that's the only way to actually determine which flies are sterile flies that we released and which flies are actually fertile flies that are capable of producing infestation. So at this point, um, the last fertile fly that was found in the Keys, uh, I believe it was November 17th or, or some point in November. And uh, the only fertile fly that's been found in surveillance in the uh, homestead area on the mainland uh, was a, a fertile male fly that was captured on uh, January 11th. Not very good. So it seems like our <clears throat> sterile technique is taking hold down there as well. So along those lines on the next slide, we talked a lot already about the sterile te technique. Again, I would refer you to Aegis's page on Scrum that goes into a lot more detail. Um, but what was I guess one of the positive, another one of the positive things of this, again, since this was on the heels of the Zika virus um, response that was down there in South Florida, many people down there, especially in the Miami area, were very nervous because they didn't want sprays. They didn't, you know, everybody here is a whole genetically modified. It's, you know, it's going to have three heads and it's going to be bright purple. Um, because people had already been a little bit primed for that, once we got the word out about sterile insect technique and how they were produced, what they do, that they're not, they don't become established in the local population down there, they breed only one time and then they die, um, they're just fertile flies. The public actually took this really well. We were anticipating a lot of blowback from that, but the public down there actually took it very well, so we were thankful for that one too. Uh, some of the other details that are on this slide we've kind of gone through. They are treated with low-dose cobalt radiation, and then we release millions of PIPA twice weekly, and we expect to do it three to five months beyond the last confirmed positive in an animal. And so I believe Dr. Shear and Dr. Beck and some of um, our leadership is going down there in March, and we'll determine kind of the plan going forward on this one, too. Um, we'll just go through this a little bit quickly, too, on the sterile insect technique, how we do all of this. Like I said, this was we got on October 11th, just you know, 11, 12 days after we got confirmation of this. And so, in general, those people are put out on Tuesdays and Friday mornings, and we receive these flights from Panama on a chartered plane every Monday and Thursday late morning to early afternoon. Each chamber will have over 76,000 people per chamber, and I put the asterisk next to the 35 chambers. That may or may not change depending on the fly density in the area and what Dr. Welch recommends on this as well. But it's actually putting it out there. It's not all that high tech. You can see that we, um, the flies that will come in on the cooler, they go out in these Home Depot orange buckets. They're kept in coolers to so try and keep those people cool as we get out there. It's South uh, Florida, so it's very warm and humid. And the more warm and humid it is, the quicker those flies will hatch, as you see in that cooler right there. This was taken one morning. We went out. It was already getting kind of late in the morning and getting kind of warm out there. But it's fine because those flies could still be and out in the area, and they're going to go look for their girlfriends to try and breed at that point, too. Uh, again, you see here our charter plane coming in. There's Sean. I think that we've got Casey Mitchell there, Dr. Welch. They're all coming in, meeting the plane. And again, this plane is chartered at this, this fellow. He makes the trip up here. I think it's about a five-hour flight one way um, each Monday and Thursday. <clears throat> and then the people are kept in those coolers. And then they're put in their refrigeration unit until we're ready. And then um, the teams that got releasing the pupa typically leave about 4 or 5 in the morning uh, those days, depending on the temperature and humidity, to go start putting those chambers out. Uh, so you see here, this is one of the copay technicians, Guillermo, that's loading the pupa in these chambers. And these really are their milk crates, and then they've got a screen in the bottom. 
and then the people are poured into that screen. These little rods are put in there, so we'll have four of those screens filled with pupa in each of those green chambers. And there's also an emergence indicator that's put into each of these. Several um, pupa are just put into this petri dish, and it's put in there so that once they fly, then Dr. Welch and his team can determine about the percentage of emergence. And I believe it's been you know, exceptional on that one, so it's been very successful on how they can uh, come out of this as well. Um, and here it is hanging up those chambers, those green chambers. They also have a piece of really kind of like a styrofoam that's put on top to try and keep out any other moisture and try and keep it warm enough in there as well so that the flies will come out in those little holes that are in there. And so this is really what we do. Um, between Pan Phillips, Steve Skoda, they, using GIS, they went out there and they found the best areas to release these flies. And they went out on part of the wildlife refuge and hung these chains in the trees. And then we would go and hang these chambers in the trees. And that plastic over the top is to keep the moisture out, um, also to keep the ants off of there too. Is there anything else you want to mention on this one, Sean, since you're starring in this picture as well? <laughs> well, <laughs> since you mentioned ants, I will I will make this comment. Uh, we had a we had a number of issues with predators uh, getting into the chambers. Um, the chains that you can see that suspend the chambers from trees is coated with a, a very sticky glue-like material uh, to keep ants and other insects from crawling down the chains and, and getting into the chambers. We've also had problems with raccoons. Um, raccoons are very industrious and, and uh, had a number of them that have figured out how to uh, take that styrofoam top off the chambers and feed on the pupae. So we've, some of those sites we've had to replace that styrofoam with um, thick plywood and use screws to secure it. Um, but the vast majority of the sites we haven't had problems with, but we have had some predation going on, um, most of which we think we've mitigated at this point. Okay. No oh, good raccoon. And again, you see you just got a couple of flies that are emerging from the chamber there, just beginning uh, their ecthesis. And so the response to date, um, for many of you that are on this call, you may get to sit reps. If not, uh, for those of you that are able to um, get on the secured site for APHIS, the sit reps are listed in there. They come out from John's back every week. And we've had 143 wildlife cases. Uh, all but one have been in key deer. We did have a raccoon. And the last confirmed deer was on January 7th in a place called um, I it was Mumford Key. Is that right, Sean? And um, they began doing flies out there pretty quickly, too. Um, in our nine domestic animal cases, just a few of those were confirmed positive. The rest were suspected positive. And because at that point, some had already died or been euthanized. Now again, I just want to stress accredited veterinarians, they've got to know what these reportable diseases are and to whom to report it and not um, wait and let this lag period kind of get ahead of us. Four animals were successfully treated, and we did have a dog confirmed positive January the 6th. This dog was seen at the end of December, and it was a stray dog that just showed up at someone's house. It was a kind of a poor-looking German Shepherd. Uh, the people that, um, whose house it was, they called animal control. So they did keep the dog in a chicken coop out behind their house until animal control could pick it up. And once it got through animal control and a local veterinarian, they did recognize it. They called it in, and the animal was treated immediately with Capstar, which is one of the um, methods for killing uh, screwworm larvae as well. And then when they did surveillance, we did find some dead flies and pupa in the area where their dog was pinned um, prior to animal control picking it up. And as Sean mentioned, there's only been one fertile male fly in that area. And what kind of worked to the advantage, too, was that that was a little bit of a cold snap for the keys, if you will, down there during that time. So the ones that they found were dead. And again, they've only found that one um, fertile male fly down in the area since then with a tremendous amount of uh, fly assessment going on. And then they began uh, releasing flies in Homestead on January the 13th. And so that's ongoing now as well, too. So a lot of people have asked the question, um, where did this infection come from? So in a nutshell, and because we're running short on time, the short answer is we're still not certain. And 
This um, information did come from um, Dr. Beto Perez de Leon that works with Agricultural Research Service out in Kerrville, Texas. I'm not sure if he's on the line today. Feel free to jump in if you're on there. Um, but this is information that came from him from a talk that he did a couple of weeks ago. So they were able to collect um, many of these maggots as we would confirm positives on that to do genetic testing so that we can pair the genetics of these screwworms with maggots that we know of in other regions of the Western Hemisphere to try and determine if there are either identical genetic lines or genetic similarities between these Florida response uh, or these Florida screwworms versus ones maybe that we found in Venezuela or the Caribbean or Cuba or Brazil. And really, um, so far to date, there's not a definitive answer. And so we're going to continue sampling anything if we should get them. And then with the maggots that they collected so far, they will uh, continue to compare those genetically. And you see there, it's what's called little geographic revolution or resolution thing. We can't say for certain where they came from. Um, but I will tell you this. So it's interesting, um, you know, learning more about the DNA testing that ARS does with that. And you can see there in that second bullet point, um, They'll continue to collect samples from all of these other regions that you see here on the map through the Caribbean and um, then down into South America too, comparing what we collected from Florida with some of their contemporary samples where they have known um, infestations or just it's endemic in those areas too. And so then they'll continue to improve the genetic testing of these. <laughs> And then hopefully from that, um, we can facilitate the exclusion to say, no, it definitely didn't come from this area, that area. I think a lot of people assume it came from Cuba just because of the proximity, but there's really no definitive way to say because when you look at the genetics of it, they're basically, the ones that we found in Florida are, have genetic similarities to any other sperms that we see anywhere here in the Western Hemisphere. So Cuba may be part of it, but it may have a big South, South American component to it as well. And then just kind of wrapping up here to see, um, again, accredited veterinarians must maintain that knowledge of their reportable foreign animal diseases. Um, just can't stress that enough. We don't need to get behind the, the eight ball on this one. It was bad enough that it was screwworms, but if it were any of our vesicular diseases or anything else, um, we just we can't afford um, to let that linger out there. And then you see there, uh, it's part of their responsibilities, part of 9 CFR. And it does cause and has caused um, taxpayers millions of dollars in our response efforts, unnecessary animal deaths, and these are endangered species, and um, potential risk to human health as well. And again, as you know, what we see in so many other cases, whether it's high path avian influenza, a potential um, African swine fever, classical swine fever here um, in the United States, wildlife, and I'd say potential enough that we have it. I'm just saying that this is. <laughs> Again, wildlife always tends to play such a big role in disease outbreaks and maintenance of diseases in our populations, too. And um, again, one of the upsides of this, too, is that federal, state, and county officials have been working under an ICS unified command from the beginning. And um, I think it's, I think this outbreak seems to have gone probably about as well as it could, especially with all these different entities working together. And again, one thing that's come up all along, especially in the very beginning, because this is a gruesome disease and got a lot of attention internationally. You know, you see headlines, zombie deer, and um, you know, tons of, of um, media coverage on this one as well. Social media, I made the mistake of looking at too much and it just, you know, make you mad looking at it because the information is wrong. But um, having a public information officer on site and ready to go, I mean, that's very important too because um, there were a lot of questions and a lot of, I don't say a lot of misinformation, but there was just a lot of media attention from the beginning and being prepared. And um, so I'll kind of let um, Sean take it from here. This is the slide um, that's just got some more information if anyone is interested. The first link on here is from the Florida Department of Ag and Consumer Services, and this is their screwworm page where you can also sign up for weekly updates from the conditional screwworm. And in case anyone happens to be listening from Florida or if you're ever down there and visiting, this is the hotline number down there as well. And then our link here too is for um, veterinary services for our screw one page. And then our credits down there at the bottom. We just had tons of people that have um, had a tremendous impact on this response too and helping put together a lot of these presentations that we use. And I just want to let you guys know too that we're working with LPA with Donna Carlson and um, planning on coming out with a I say more generic, it's just not going to be Florida specific, Florida specific um, brochure that's going to come out 
probably in the next couple of months so that we can kind of coat um, the southern United States in this to um, really raise awareness for anyone that may come across this too. Okay. Sean, did you have stuff that you wanted to add about the operations or the most recent activities that are going on down there? Yeah, just a couple of things, and I'll be quick because I know we're we're kind of long on time here already. But uh, just just an update on on anticipated uh, demobilization, if you will. We're working in the keys on the. Uh, on the date of January the 10th, which was the last confirmation of a key deer on Big Munson Island. And then in the homestead area, we're working from the January 11th date, um, the last finding of a, a fertile fly on surveillance. So the current plan, and Joanna mentioned this would be evaluated again in, later in March, but the current plan is to continue sterile fly release in the keys, uh, up until about April the 10th, and, and sterile fly release in, in the Homestead area until about April the 11th. So uh, we should wind up on the, on the same day, essentially, uh, with our with our last fly release. Um, basically, operations has been fairly consistent over the last few months uh, with the interdiction station, with um, our education and outreach, with uh, our surveillance, fly surveillance teams, and then a uh, the major focus now, of course, is uh, sterile fly release. <clears throat> the only other thing that I'd add that maybe wasn't covered well in, in the way it was, one, and Joanna mentioned this, and then I think we just have to keep mentioning this one, is that uh, in this particular situation, uh, we had an FAD um, that wasn't reported for nearly three months, and it, it, it put us behind the eight ball significantly uh, in the beginning of this incident because we, by failure to report, we had at least three generations, maybe four generations of life cycle of the swap that were allowed to um, to go on before we could put any kind of sterile lease program in place. Dr. Wiltz, um shared some numbers with me, which basically indicates that in comparison to some of the most recent outbreaks that, that have been worked in the Western Hemisphere, Aruba, Jamaica, um, that the the fly population, the fertile fly population in the Keys was probably 100 times higher than than in those previous outbreaks. So, so this Florida infestation will, will probably go down in the record books as being one of the most concentrated high population infestations um, known. Um, in many cases, uh, a, a sterile fly release is accomplished uh, aerially with, with flies being released, um, obviously, from airplanes. We elected not to do that in this case because of the geography of the Keys. Um, it would be terribly difficult to uh, do aerial release without releasing many of the flies into the water. So the, the chambers that you saw on the slides were were the uh, preferred route because we could concentrate uh, sterile release in the areas that surveillance indicated it, it needed to be in. Um, so reporting uh, is, I guess, number one take on the lesson for sure. Then the second one that, that comes to my mind is is for us as an agency, isn't that 99% um, of the uh, thought process and the, the knowledge that we're operating from come from Dr. Wells. And he is an outstanding individual. Uh, he is the OIE expert on New World Screw Worm. Uh, but for, from our standpoint as an agency, uh, we need to be developing that expertise and that knowledge in in screwworm and in response uh, to screwworm infestations, and you know we we didn't have that prior to this incident, and so a number of people are being trained uh, going forward in fly surveillance techniques, especially uh, many people have had the opportunity to deploy and become familiar with. Uh, with the response efforts, with sterile fly release, uh, sterile insect technique, and so on. 
So, um, in that regard, this this incident has been beneficial in, in supplementing our knowledge that that we didn't really have before, uh, and hopefully we will we will take the lessons learned there and and move forward uh, and make sure that we um, develop a, a cadre of individuals that that uh, NVS that can uh, work in the future anytime if we have another um, screwworm infestation. It's been 50 years since uh, we eradicated screwworm, and in that 50 years, um, I think we lost a lot of our ability to respond and the knowledge that we needed. Um, other than that, I'll be happy to, to take any questions or turn it back over to Joanna and Liz. Yeah, I'm okay. done. Yeah. I do have one written question. Um, the question is, given the success of New World Screwworm Eradication on mainland North and Central America, is there impetus to utilize or share these techniques across the Caribbean, in particular with Cuba and Haiti? Yeah, um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'll let you take that one, Sean. <laughs> well, I've, I've had a few conversations with Dr. Wilkes about that, that very thought process. Uh, you know, in the past, obviously, the relationship between the United States and Cuba has not been favorable. And uh, that political climate is changing now, and I think there is a, a great deal of interest in some discussions going on uh, about the potential to, um, to develop a, an eradication program in cooperation with Cuba. I think any discussion in that area, I certainly I don't have first-hand knowledge of, and I think it, it's in its very preliminary stages. Um, but but for us, uh, Cuba would be obviously the the first uh, priority, and then um, if, if that were to occur and it's successful, then Haiti, Dominican Republic, some of those other Caribbean nations would would certainly be. Um, beneficial to us to, to pursue that. I have another question. I have a couple of questions coming in. Um, the next one is, given our changing relationship with Cuba and increases in travel and trade between the USA and the Caribbean in general, <clears throat> excuse me, would an update on the epidemiology of screwworm in the Caribbean and a pathway risk analysis for a possible reintroduction be worthwhile and perhaps even help us with preparedness? I think so. I think that's a lot, and Sean can speak to this too. That much of what's going on now, um, whether it's with international services and agriculture research service, the genetic work that's been done. Again, just in the interest of time, I didn't get into a lot of information on the DNA analysis on this one, but that's part of it too. Is working through international services and ARS. <clears throat> um, so I can say that they um, have been using GS. GIS techniques, understanding the landscape and genetics of screwworms, um, getting some more geographical and, and environmental conditions um, where screwworms live, where they don't live. And so they are working with other countries trying to determine a lot of these. And while we hate this happen, I mean, it has kind of spurred um, more interest in this. And they are, I don't know if Dr. Bess is on or others that can speak to it more about um, some of the other work that's been initiated or is in the works because of this as well. So to the extent that it, it gets into a lot of detail, I'm probably not the one um, to speak to that, if, um, but uh, I know that a lot of that is in the works that they're, that they're doing and the genetic um, testing that's being done. Um, that's when they work cooperatively with these other countries. And I have one additional question. Uh, the question is, what is the April 10th date based on for discontinuation of the sterile 5 releases? Well, the, the April 10th is, is basically 90 days post uh, January 10th, which was the confirmation date on the uh, last key deer, which was on Big Munson Island. So the current plan, unless that's rethought, when, when the concept of sterile fly release end date is revisited in March, is to go 90 days uh, past the last confirmed case, and that's where the April 10th comes from. Okay. Do we have any verbal questions? 
And ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a verbal question, you can do so by pressing pound two on your telephone handset. Again, that's pound two if you would like to ask a verbal question today. Okay, and I don't have any other questions coming through either. Okay. Yeah, I don't have anything else to add unless Shonda. I would just like to thank everybody for uh, joining us for today's webinar. And just to also let you know, we are going to be holding a biosecurity webinar, Train to Contain, with Lori Miller on March 7th at 11 a.m. Um, if anybody is interested in that. And we'll be sending out other announcements for upcoming webinars. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you, everybody in the audience, for joining us today. This concludes the call. You may now disconnect.